The museum began at the house at 607 Grove Street. Later on, we were able to obtain the, the building at 611 Grove Street, which was also part of it slated to be torn down for a parking lot. And that's where we now house the main gallery, just like other places in Boise where you'd say, go to Hyde Park, now people say, I'll meet you on the Basque Block. And it's become known as a cultural and historic area in our city. So then the, um, the development of the museum, we've continued to grow in our services and programs. And as part of that, we've gone back and done a restoration and interpretation of the, the Cyrus Jacob Zubedawaga house. We've, we've actually discovered that there had been a fire in the front room, and that led to our curator then, Jeff Johns, saying, oh gosh, I can see artifacts down there. We need to do an archeological dig. So fla flash forward how many years, in May of 2012, we're doing some work on a, a portion of the enclosed porch that we had never uh, done anything with. And sure enough, a volunteer cuts a board and it falls and takes a minute to make a sound. And he opens it up and there, there's the well of the Jacob's house that they had probably built in 1864. And so we knew, okay, we had already planned to do an archeological dig, a brief four day one with use of volunteers. But when the well was discovered, Mark Munch, the lead archaeologist, said, nah, we better call in some extra help. So we came out, Mark Warner and I came out to the Bass Museum and Cultural Center, consulted and took a look at the well, and we saw all kinds of artifacts on the surface of the well, as well as um, on the surface of the ground above the well, including tobacco tins and ceramics. And so we saw these artifacts and knew that if we brought a crew of students out here to excavate, that we would indeed find things. Um, and that's when we knew that we should be running a field project here um, through the University of Idaho and through the Bass Museum and Cultural Center. But we never, never fathomed that the well was still, you know, intact underneath the porch. It just didn't dawn on us. Just as a boarding house, all they were trying to do was survive. You know, they had, would have had no idea, no concept that it would be a museum, you know, that the, the history would be like it is now. There we go. <laughs> yeah. Woo! Woo! Okay, Stacy and Jessica, I got three more. Did you get something? Yeah. Compound EXT. Very cool. And more. I got all oh, that so cool. This is the we had a historic picture of the house that we've had for over eight years and looked at it hundreds of times. And he and I were trying to figure out where is the well in relation to how the house is today because there was an 1878 addition onto it. And we're using our fingers saying, okay, here's the door we came through. And he was using a flashlight. And then it was like, well, there it is, right where Mrs. Jacobs has her hand on the handle of the well. And we, the exhibit in the museum right now is called Hidden in Plain Sight. And it was there, it was hidden in plain sight all these years. And to have uncovered an 1864 well in the center of the city is huge. If you look at the, some city maps, in 1880s there wasn't city water here. By 1893 there was a water line coming through the back of the house. I think the well was what they were using until they got piped in water. And then it's just a hole in the ground that's a pain and then it's a trash pit. So I would bet somewhere between about 1888 and 1893 is when they uh, got water and then once they got water they didn't need the well and that was a trash pit and there goes there goes all the dishes there goes all the stuff that breaks in the house there goes food remains it's a hole in the ground the full bottle of the shoe polish still inside corked um, just recently found the handle of like a like a cast iron pan lots of metals coming out a few bottles there's a little a little one complete more of the ceramics, kind of the, the blue that we had been finding earlier, so probably the complete set. I think it's like a tea, like a really big teacup with a saucer. And it, it's from a, from a public outreach perspective, this is a tremendous opportunity because uh, we have in 50 feet from excavation to screening to processing the artifacts and you can wander around and see and talk to whoever you want. Well, I think with me, it's mainly just the idea that it's bringing back history that it's really lots of fun to see, come back and see it kind of come to life again. If you look out in the front room, you have this picture of 
you know, here's Boise, dirt roads, wagons, horse-drawn carriages. The, the outside looks, looks rough and you think, oh man, I wouldn't want to be there. But the inside, people are trying to replicate, you know, genteel life of the second half of the 19th century. Teacups, saucers, ceramics from France, ceramics from England, bottles from and products from all over the East Coast. Now, as we get into this further, I'm sure there's going to be a whole bunch of other little stories to tell about what people were eating, what their clothes looked like, uh, what children's lives was like, um, maybe how their health was based on the medicines we found and so on. Um, lower class, middle class, and upper class Americans during the late 1800s and early 1900s gave their, their children um, or their, their, their girls um, dolls to teach them proper gender roles and kind of promoted this gender ideology of women belonged in the home. And those things speak more broadly about what people believe during this time period. Um, and often those beliefs sharply deviate from what we believe today. To me, just understanding kind of that lineage of our history as a nation is, is what's so enlightening. I believe that archaeology should be engaged in contemporary society in, in discussions about preservation, in discussions about you know, raising consciousness about histories beneath your feet and so on. And this is a tremendous opportunity to sort of convey to a lot of people that archaeology has some relevance to today's community. The thing that I really, really loved about it was being able to be up close to the project and actually lean over them as they're working, take photographs, that sort of thing. <clears throat> In the past, we've seen archaeological uh, sites where they're way far away from the public, they're fenced off, it's like it's a big secret. This was, this was really cool. The preservation of the buildings in this block are what give a community roots. They're what help people re situate themselves in a place and it makes an economic difference. The presence of a place like the Basque block is what makes Boise a more charming place to live. What makes people say, I want to live here and not out in some other, some other town in the West. We hope that people will think about historic preservation um, and you know, if they decide to do some construction on their house or, or involve in a construction project and start finding artifacts, they'll think twice about what they should do with them, call an archaeologist, and, and learn about the history of the people that lived in that building. It's, you know, it's, it's unique to Boise's history, it's unique to Idaho archaeology, and I think it's been an incredible opportunity for a lot of people to experience the past and see archaeology firsthand. Uh, when you have 500 to 1,000 people visit an archaeological site in two weeks, you're doing great things. And this, we've, we're spinning some stories now, but we've got more stories that are going to come over the next, next couple years.